disciples and he sent them out. And most of them were young people. So I'm sure today is the same. The Lord wants to use young people. And the way you go now will determine the rest of your life. And I was had on my heart to read with you a verse or two in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Now it's only a few verses, like sometimes I have lots of verses and I ask to read around, but I don't know what is the best procedure for tonight. Um, I'll just read those verses for you. Colossians 2, starting from verse 6. Just, oh no, just two verses, 6. Thank you. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a background. This epistle was written by Paul to the Colossians. That was in the area, perhaps you have heard about Ephesus, but a few hours from Ephesus, there, were, there was a valley, the Lycus Valley, and there were three cities, Colossae and Hierapolis and Laodicea. And um, Paul had, as far as we know, when he wrote this letter, he had not been there yet. Maybe he had been there afterwards, but we know there was one person who got saved when Paul was working in Ephesus. Perhaps you know that Paul was working in the city of Ephesus. It was a very well-known city in um, Turkey, present-day Turkey. And he had worked there for three years in Ephesus. Ephesus, and you can read it if you make a note, you read it in Acts chapter 19 and 20. Uh, Ephesus used to be the center of occultism. Um, in days past, from uh, Babylonia, uh, was transported this uh, mystic religion to that area, uh, Ephesus. Ephesus became the center of this uh, religion. And you had the well-known statue. They claimed it was fallen out of heaven. It was dedicated to the, this goddess of fertility. There was a huge temple, uh, which is one of the seven old uh, wonders of the world. And anyway, there was a lot going on. And there, where the center of Satan's power was, Satan's realm, there the Lord established a church. And it is really striking if you read uh, in Acts 19 how this uh, started. I'll just uh, read a few verses in Acts 19. You say, what does this have to do Colossae? But I'll, I'll show that in a minute. So in Acts 19, Paul was at work. Um, first for two years and then he stayed a bit longer. He had already stayed there for six months in the synagogue, so at least two and a half years. So, And then what we see then, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Uh, Acts 19, verse 11. And in, chap in uh, verse 10, we see that he worked there for two years. So first six months in the synagogue, then two years outside the synagogue. And if you read verse 9, you see what was going on. In verse 9, um, just the last part of verse 9, it says that he separated the disciples and then disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Tyrannus was a, a teacher um, or orator. He taught people in his school. He had perhaps a philosopher who had his own school. And the people would go there, they pay for the course, and then they would be taught by this Tyrannus. Now, what they have found from research, uh, they found that the people usually had um, a siesta between 11 and 4. It's pretty long, but they had, that was their siesta. So they could go home, have a meal, and then go to sleep, and then at 4 o'clock they would be back at work. Now, what happened during that time when the people had the siesta, when the students here in the school of Tyrannus went home for lunch and so on, Paul rented that school and was teaching the believers. And so where everybody was sleeping in town, they were awake, they were listening to Paul. What, a, what an energy, what an interest. And that is the context of what you see in verse 10. For two years, it says, they continued in the space of two years so that all they that dwelt in Asia, that's Asia Minor, that is the 
Roman province of Asia, of which Ephesus was the most important city, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And so that was a ministry that was going on, and it was not limited to that city, all in Asia. And that means then also that from the surrounding area, people came. And I believe that Epaphras, who brought the gospel later to Colossae, was saved during that ministry that Paul had here in Ephesus. And then he went home, and he became an evangelist, and he started to preach, and many people got saved there in Colossae. You can see that in um, Colossae, uh, Colossians chapter 1, um, that he had taught them, in verse 7, ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now one more thing about what was going on in Ephesus. In Ephesus, as I said, it was the, the center of occultism. And you see that God's power was at work in a very special way. In Acts 19, verse 12, from Paul's body, they carried um, towels around, handkerchiefs, aprons, and then they um, um, brought it to the people who were sick, and then they got healed. And then there was someone who imitated that. They used the name of the Lord in vain. But if you read that story from verse 13 on, that is really striking to show what was going on. Certain of the uh, vagabond Jews, that means they were traveling, they had the ministry of ex as exorcists, and they were there in Ephesus, and they took it upon themselves to call up over them of whom they were supposed to exercise the evil spirits. They called upon those the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And in verse 14, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief of the priest, which did so also. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Here we see how the Lord's name was made known, and as a result, in verse 18, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Verse 19, many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Conclusion, verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. This is God's power. So what we see here, the Lord in heaven, the Lord Jesus, who died on this earth, then he, was, he rose again, then he ascended to heaven, and from heaven he started a ministry. He sent the Holy Spirit, and he used his people to carry the gospel worldwide. And that work is still continuing today, that people can be saved. I know of a person who got saved this week, and perhaps you know of another person who got saved this week. The Lord wants to save as many as he can, because judgment is coming. But before judgment will fall on this earth, he will come to take us away from this scene. That's the rapture. The Lord will come and take us away from this scene. Are you ready? If you're not ready yet, today is the day of salvation that you can be saved. And that is what happened to the Colossians through this ministry of Epaphras, who was saved under Paul's ministry. He went to Colossae, preached the gospel, and taught the people there. Now, that brings us to Colossians 2, verse 6, that we have read tonight. And that speaks of believers. So what I'm saying now does not apply to those who are not saved yet. So if you are not saved yet, now is the time to make that, thank you, to make that right with the Lord, to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I confess that I have failed. I have dishonored you. Please save me. The Lord will answer that prayer. Whatever way you pray, the Lord knows the heart. 
but you can be saved tonight. And then, when you are a believer, that is what we see then in Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. There are seven or eight points that I briefly want to highlight with you, and that is an encouragement for all the believers. First thing, as ye therefore have received, God has given us something. He has given us the gift of salvation. He has given us, I sometimes say, the greatest present that you can imagine. What did they receive? They received a person. It sometimes happens, you give a present to someone else and they don't like it. That can happen. But I don't think if you have received Christ Jesus, Christ means the anointed one, did you know there is only one person in the whole universe that God has anointed? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was on this earth, he, was, he is God, blessed over all, but he was here as a baby in the manger. And then when he, after 30 years, when he started his public ministry, God anointed him. God sent the Holy Spirit from heaven. And he came in the form of a dove and rested on his head. And God anointed him. And that day God said, this is my beloved son in whom I have found my delight. And from other scriptures we know that this means that God anointed him. That is the anointed one. In Greek that is Christ, anointed. In Hebrew, it is Mashiach, Messiah. That is the same meaning, anointed one. He is the anointed one. But my point is there's only one that God anointed. What does that mean? All the others did not qualify. There was, after four years of human history, when God opened the heavens, he could only do that upon the head of Christ. There was no one else who qualified. And so God anointed him. And if you read Acts 2, you see when the Lord Jesus went to heaven, Peter says, God made him Lord and Christ. There in heaven, God anointed him a second time. There was now a man in heaven that had never been a man in heaven before. Now there was a man in heaven, and God anointed him. And the Holy Spirit, with whom he was anointed, came down on this earth in Acts 2. It says in Hebrews 1 that God anointed him above his companions. The companions were on earth, the believers on earth. And they shared then in this unction that you read in Acts 2. Why I'm saying all this? To show you the greatness of this present. When it says, you have therefore received. Is it true? Did you receive this wonderful present, the greatest present you can imagine? Or do you say, no, thank you? And this is a perfect man, Jesus is indicated he is a man, but he is also God. It's a mystery. The name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation, or Jehovah saves. And he got this name as a baby there when he was born in Bethlehem. That is the name that was given to him, Jesus. You can read it in Matthew 1. And so here we see two things. This Jesus, who is a perfect man who never sinned, who could not sin, although he was a human being and was tempted in many ways, but there was no sin in him. God could anoint him, and God anointed him in view of his service for this earth, his public ministry on this earth. And he was led by the Holy Spirit. Many thoughts can be added to that, but I just want to mention this as the first point. Did you receive this wonderful person through faith? That is God's present for everyone who believes. God has a person, and he gives him, and it is up to us to receive him. And the word receive here implies the thought of identify with the gift. So you make it your own. You appropriate that gift. It really is something that you make it, you make it your own. And this is a wonderful privilege. That is what God does. He gives the best. And he has expressed in that gift everything that's in his heart. 
So that's my first point. Did you receive that wonderful gift? Or do you say, no, thank you? You don't have to answer me, but that's a question that God asked each one of you. And then God would also ask, if you have received him, if you have become a believer, what do you do with that present? Do you just put it in the corner? Or do you appreciate that present? Curios means he is then in charge. Curios also means that he is Jehovah God. It also means that he is in charge. He's Lord. And sometimes we say this. If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. I repeat that. If the Lord Jesus is not really Lord of all the areas of our lives, then he is not Lord at all. So that's, a, that's pretty much of a challenge. I said earlier, God gives this greatest gift, but every privilege comes with a responsibility. What do we do with that gift? And that is connected with the thought that he's Lord. If this greatest gift that I have received implies that he is Lord, am I going to do what he wants me to do? Or I say, no, thank you. This is a great privilege, but every privilege implies a responsibility. And that is what this verse implies. He is Lord. And then he says, so walk ye in him. So you have received that wonderful gift through faith, and then God says, now you walk in him. That means that is your daily walk. Now the word walk in the scriptures implies everything that you are doing, everything that you are saying, your attitude. Last week, my mother passed away, and my brother talked with the funeral director, and she was also the embalmer who has, had embalmed him, made her ready to put her in the coffin. And she said, she must have been a very nice and sweet and happy lady. My brother said, how can you, how can you see that? She had been in the hospital. She had really diminished a lot. And if you would not have known that, you could not see that. But this lady said, yeah, I can see if a person was grumpy, if a person was um, agitated, restless. I can see that when I prepare that body. Now, that is what I want to tie in with this. So walk ye in him. If we have received this wonderful present, it will make you happy. My mother at one time told me, when she understood something of the Bible, of the Old Testament, how it speaks of the Lord Jesus, the types in the Old Testament, even Genesis 1 speaks of him in many different ways. She said, it was like a new Bible that I received. And I just want to mention that to you, that is how she became a happy lady, a happy, she was mother of nine children. She was very busy and yet very happy. And so this is because of the gifts she had received and now continued on with him. Walk ye in him. Walk, it means including what you do in your spare time, it, it, what you do uh, in your free time. It includes everything. The walk in the New Testament means the way you react. Someone hits you in the face, how are you going to react? Someone really bothers you, how are you going to react? Your boss is not nice to you, how are you going to respond? Um, you get an accident. You start to... I heard, I don't say... I mean, that is sometimes... How do you respond? I heard the other day, it was a brother, there was something uh, happening on his farm and he started to say bad words. That is not, but that is part of his walk that shows who he really is. Now, this walk that we see here is you walk in him. So that means you stay connected with him. Everything you do is in fellowship with him. And I said earlier, the Lord is Lord of every 
area of my life. I have to give him that place. That means he is going to direct me if I have to make a choice. I can ask him to guide me. Um, the Lord has thoughts for every area of my life. Let's say this way. If I exclude the Lord from a certain area, I don't want the Lord to have anything to do with this part of my life. I have a problem. The Lord, as I said, is Lord of all. And so we have to make him Lord of all. We have to honor him as Lord of all. That includes my spare time. It includes even my thoughts. Some people say thoughts are free. No, as a Christian... Everything I think, I say, I do is under the authority of Christ who is Lord. And I am showing that in my walk. So walk ye in him. You get a bad mark, you still continue with him. People give you a bad mark because they don't like you because you are a Christian. You continue to walk in him. So I could give many examples. You walk in him, in fellowship with him, and everything you do, from going to bed, getting up, from going to your job, getting home, everything, you walk in him. It is all inclusive. This includes every aspect of my life, studying anything, you name it. Starting a relationship with a girl or a boy, you walk in him. It is it's everything to do with this verse, walk ye in him. That implies every area of our life dating, or whatever you can come up with. And especially the thoughts. The thoughts can carry us away from the Lord. Today I heard of a young lady. She went to university. She had confessed the Lord at age 12, and she was really a bright young person following the Lord. She was misled by a lecturer in the university who was teaching New Testament, said, you know, there is no good and evil. Everything is okay. Whatever you do is okay. And she followed that teaching. She's now in the New Age movement. So at that moment, she stopped walking in him. She stopped that connection with the Lord. She was influenced by this lecturer. And you're exposed to many things at university, at work, and the enemy mobilizes his forces against you to make you fall. And how important it therefore is for each one of us to really stay close to the Lord. We know our society is, there's a lot about sex. Now, not Satan invented that, God invented it. But he limited to the married couple. And so he wants a married couple to enjoy that relationship and that's part of his lordship over them. That is part of walking in him. But that's one area of our lives. But it applies to every area of our lives. As I said earlier, job, hobbies, everything. And so ye walk in him. As you have received him, now you honor him by walking in him. And that is how there is a balance between privilege and responsibility. We had that at a conference where I was today, a Bible conference. We, see, we saw how Every privilege that we have received implies great responsibility. That is what we have. The greatest gift implies great responsibility. And the Lord wants to encourage us. I'm not here to, to chastise you or to put you down. I'm here with the Lord's help to encourage you, to show you this is the path we should go. It's for me and for you. I'm not going a different path from you, we go all the same path, following the Lord Jesus. Walk in him, in fellowship with him. That brings us to the next point in verse 7, rooted. Now, when you hear that expression, I think of a tree. Uh, just, just leave that thought and go back one more time to verse 6. What happened with the Colossians, I've mentioned they learned from Epaphras in chapter 1, verse 7. He was teaching them. They were saved through Epaphras' ministry, and then he started to teach them. So he brought them into God's school. 
um, we saw earlier that Paul was teaching in the school of Tyrannus. Paul was not a philosopher like Tyrannus, but Paul brought the people into God's school. That school building became also part of God's school, but it is not limited to that. When you go to university, you are also in God's school. Sounds strange, but it is true. Would you agree with that? You have been in university, and many of you probably are in university, but we are at God's school, not those hours that we are at university, we are in God's school the whole time. Even during the holidays, we are always in God's school. Now that is verse six that we had earlier. If you like it or not, you are in God's school. And you read James chapter three, and you see about the wisdom from above. And he wants to teach us, he wants to lead us on. The wisdom from above, we are in God's school. And that is then connected with the walk that we saw in verse 6. But now it brings us to a next thought in verse 7, rooted in him. Rooted is like a tree. You, this, um, let's put it this way. A tree that grows puts down its um, roots deeper and deeper. And... Uh, they say in general that as tall the tree is, so deep it's in the soil, the roots. So you have a tree of 100 feet, the roots are 100 feet. That is the balance, and that is uh, absolutely necessary. Without those roots deep in the ground, the tree would fall. Secondly, the tree could not be nourished. Those roots provide nourishment. And so it is for us. You can read in Psalm 1, that the believer is planted at water brooks and the tree has to be well rooted. You have to get your food supply. Now apply that to every believer here. I'm not saying hands up, but just this question. Did you open the scriptures today and read the scriptures? Did you pray? Do you do that on a consistent basis? Some people think, well, once a week is enough. Now, if the tree would say, well, once a week, uh, get something to drink from those roots, that's enough, it would fast uh, decay. So the tree gets the supply on a continuous basis. We were talking about prayer earlier. That is, some, some compare it with breathing. It's an ongoing process, praying. Of course, there are moments that we pray specifically out loud, but it is really ongoing. That is cultivating the relationship with the Lord on an ongoing basis. And so this tree puts its roots down and gets its supply from the soil. That is what we need. We need to put our roots down and get deeper and deeper in the Word. There are layers that you discover in the Word. It goes deeper and deeper. I'm very much interested in the DNA code. I'm not a scientist, but I like to read those books about the DNA code, and I have sometimes seen a presentation of a scientist about it. It is fascinating. It is mind-boggling. Now, I want to apply that also to the Word of God, studying the Word of God, and you dig deeper and deeper. It is fascinating. The tree puts its roots in the ground, and you get your supply from the word of God. That brings us to another expression, built up. Now, this expression, built up, is connected in the scriptures with two concepts. A house that needs to be built up. Uh, some of you are architects or builders. You know, you don't start a house by putting the roof on. You start a house from the foundation, right? Do I say something, something wrong? It's right. Good, Nader confirms, and he knows. And so here is the same thought here. Build up, it starts from the foundation. You have to go always back to the foundation. Who is the foundation? Christ, again. Christ is all. So he is the foundation. And he helps us then to be built up. And it is in him, we saw in him in verse 6, in the walk. Now we are in him in connection with this 
building up. It's in fellowship with him. It is relying on him. It is staying close to him. That's an ongoing process. And this building up, God uses many gifts to help us in this building up. The building up of the body. Uh, that is, all the believers together are being built up. But also, individually, we need to be built up. And um, even when we talk to each other, we better build each other up. Sometimes we put each other down or we criticize one another instead of building up. This building up is an ongoing process and we need to be built up to be stronger and stronger because the enemy is there, as I said earlier, he wants to put us down, he wants to destroy us. And so this rooting and growing, this building up, and building up implies also um, be an encouragement for each other, try to help each other. That is relevant for all of us to be involved in this work of building up. Um, I remember when this hall was being prepared, a lot of people came to help with uh, the cleaning and everything. It's just an example how we can work together. And so in the body of Christ, everyone has a gift and we can help each other to be built up. Of course, the Lord is there also. He is at the same time at work. I don't exclude that point. The Lord is also working through us. If you do something for the Lord to be a blessing for another believer, to build him or her up, at the same time, the Lord is at work. That is why it says, in him. It is in fellowship with him. It is under his control. And then the next expression is in verse 7, established or confirmed in the faith. So that shows something important. Everything that we are doing today has to be through faith. Now you, if you just do it from a human perspective, you go and visit someone who is sick, and then after a month you are sick, nobody comes, well, you get upset. That is where faith comes in. Faith puts our trust not in people. Faith puts our trust in the Lord. And faith makes us see the things from God's perspective. That's what we need. A few months ago, we had a study not in the front. Uh, it was in October. And we talked about Abram. Abram is the father of the believers. Abram is really uh, the man of faith. And so he is an example for that for us to walk in faith. And God wants us to be confirmed in faith. Sometimes we have doubts, you know, and you became a believer, and then you start to doubt. Doubts are like darts, or like arrows from the enemy to, um, to stop you from growing. But the Lord wants to confirm that faith. He wants you to become stronger in faith. But it has to be faith. You cannot grow by saying, okay, from this day on, I will grow. From this day on, I will not sin anymore. From this day on, I will be a good believer. Does that work? It won't work. We have, because at that moment, you still put your trust in yourself. But here, confirmed or established in faith means you put your trust in God. You put your trust in the Lord. Not just as a slogan like on the American coin, in God we trust. No, I mean in reality. This means you put your trust in God. And then he establishes you. He confirms that faith. God is always confirming what he has started. God has given you that faith. And now God will look after that, that it will be confirmed. That you will grow. Peter, before he passed away, he wrote an important letter, 2 Peter, and the end of that letter says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to grow. And if you stop growing, you go down. If you stop growing, that moment the enemy is there to take you under his control. So this faith is very important. And then it says, we're almost done, Two more or three more expressions. As ye have been taught. 
Now, I don't know what the first day was in your life that you were taught. Can you go back in your mind? The first day that you really realized, now I have been taught. For me, that goes back a long, long time. Well, because I'm a bit older than you. But my, I talked about my mother. And she taught me a song when I was maybe one year old. I can't remember that, of course. But when I got older, she repeated that song. And so that's why I still remember it. And that song was speaking of the Lord. So through that song, my mother taught me. And in other ways, my parents, my father taught me. Later on, we had a, a Bible class for young people. And my father and other brother did that and taught me. And I taught, I, I learned in the assembly. I learned going to conferences. I, so this teaching is an ongoing process, as you have been taught. But it start at day one. The moment you're born, the teaching starts. And so it applies to a believer. The moment you become a believer, the teaching starts. And we need teaching because we need to be indicated the way we go. Today, that's not popular. Today, the emphasis on experience. Now, God is not against experience. But God wants you to have the experience in the right context. He wants to teach us and then enjoy what we have learned. The experience will flow from that. Not the other way. So it's important to be established in the faith, to be confirmed in the faith, and to be taught. And that teaching, I said earlier, we're on God's school, we are at God's university, that is also an ongoing process. But it doesn't stop there. Like, I love the scriptures, I like to learn, I like to teach, but that's not the whole story. When we think of Paul as a great teacher, he was looking for a result. He was looking that the believers would respond to God in worship and adoration. He was looking for the f that the believers would put this into practice in their own lives. Um, yes. It was not put your trust in yourself but put your trust in God. If you study Romans 7, to give you an example, at the end of Romans 7, that is a battle between the old nature and the new nature. And he is discouraged. He has no way out. As long as he puts his trust in himself, tries to manage on his own, he doesn't succeed. He gets discouraged, depressed. And then at the end of the chapter, he looks out to God. And that's where faith comes in. Faith means you introduce God into the picture. It's not faith in yourself. A lot of people today have great faith, but they have the faith in themselves. Faith that we speak about here in verse 7 and in other scriptures in the New Testament is faith in God, faith in the Lord Jesus. It means you put your trust in him. That start the moment you, be, you believe. Uh, uh, John 3.16 uh, God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There is where it started. Put your trust in him. But what happens then, the moment you have put your trust in him, you still have the old nature. And then you see this battle between the old nature and the new nature. That's a topic in itself, but it's good that you bring it up. But my point was that battle cannot be won by trying to be good, or do efforts towards that good goal to please God, you will not succeed. That was my point, with your own efforts. You will only succeed by putting your trust in someone outside of yourself, and that is the Lord. And the Lord will use the Holy Spirit. He will use the scriptures to help you then. That was my point. Is that clear? So let us put our trust in God, not in ourselves. That doesn't mean that we, don't, we should not do any efforts. I'm not saying that. But the efforts should be connected with faith in God, not with faith in ourselves. So the point now to conclude in verse 7 was 
Paul had been teaching the believers, Epaphras had been teaching the Colossians, but it was in view of something. It was in view of abounding in thanksgiving. God wants a result of all this. He wants us to praise him. We sang a few hymns tonight. God wants us to sing not only songs like that, but really respond to his love. I want to make this uh, illustration. When God, I, I quoted at verse John 3, 16, God has poured out into us his love. The moment we believe, God poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given at that moment. So God has a stream that comes down from heaven to where we are in our hearts. The moment we believe, God has poured out his love into our hearts. Now God is waiting for a response that from our hearts there would be a response in thanksgiving and love to him. God has given his own son. You cannot get a greater gift. I saw that, I said that earlier. We have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now what do we do with this? Do we say thank you? I read a report the other day. There was years ago in Chicago, there was a ship that um, got into trouble. And there was a young man, he was a student in theology. He wanted to become, become a pastor. He managed to rescue 17 people from that ship. But these efforts were so great that he could not continue his studies. He was sick, and a few years after that, he died. Now, of all those 17 people that he has rescued, not one came to say thank you to him. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. But that shows a point. We should be thankful. We should give thanks. What did God do? He rescued us from hell. He gave his own son to rescue us from perdition, that we would be lost. Do we say thank you? That's the, that's the thought here. Abounding with thanksgiving. So now God has given this stream of love into our hearts, and now God says, can I get a little stream back? And now Paul says, what I'm teaching you, God would like to see a whole stream of love come back to him. An abundance, like a, how can I say? Uh, it's really, it, 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 it springs up. It is active, energetic. The stream goes, stream goes back to God. That's the thought here. God has given so much. I say, no, thank you. Or I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just accept it so that I won't go in, to hell. And that's it. No. God wants our lives to be characterized by this thanksgiving. And you know, a happy person will affect other, others. Happiness is really um, contagious. If you're a happy person, it will affect others in a positive way. If you're a grumpy person, it will also rub off on others, I'm sure. But God wants us to be happy so that he receives a portion but then also others will be blessed. So I want to conclude with this. Uh, this is a summary of what God has in mind for us. He has given us the greatest gift. Did we receive it? That's a question that I cannot answer for you. You can only answer it for yourself. Did you receive this wonderful gift? Did you receive eternal life? Did you receive this precious gift? And then are you in God's school to be taught are you like this tree that grows up and that becomes stronger and stronger and established in the faith? Do you accept to be taught from the scriptures through the Holy Spirit? And then is there a response to God? That is what God is looking for, a response in connection with the gift that he has given, such a wonderful gift that we will need eternity to come in heaven to say thank you to God but God likes us to start already now. There is something of the old nature coming uh, out that, uh, that manifests itself. And that um, old nature is not walking in him, that's for sure. The new nature wants to please him, and so the new nature will walk in him. But you also have the old nature. And we are responsible 
for our actions. So you cannot blame, well, that's my old nature. There was a man in Germany, uh, he was many years ago, he uh, killed his own wife. And then when the trial came, he said to the judge, yeah, my old nature did that. And then the judge said, we will put the old nature in prison. Well, it's just a little uh, illustration. Like, we are responsible for what we do. We are responsible for whether we let the old nature react or not. We are responsible. And so God has given us the Holy Spirit to give us strength to overcome the desires of the old nature. But that is why we need to feed the new nature all the time so that the new nature becomes stronger and stronger and is able to have the victory over the old nature. Um, much more could be said about that, but I think the moment that something of the flesh uh, manifests itself, that moment we are not walking in him. We are not walking in fellowship with him. That would be my answer. But that's not to discourage you. It is really to encourage you and to see that we need to promote what is of Christ. We need to promote in our lives what is of him, not what is of the flesh. So that was a very good question. Every question is good, so perhaps there are more good questions. Difficult to answer. I said earlier, Satan uh, puts seeds of doubt into our mind. He is very effective in that. And so, but the point is, I'm responsible for allowing him to do that. So what he does with my mind and puts doubt in my mind I allow that. So again, we go back to that same point. I need to uh, have my mind controlled by the word of God. And so in connection with this, we see in Ephesians 6, we have to put on the full armor of God. So when we have the full armor of God in Ephesians 6, there is also part of that armor that will protect me then against those um, arrows that he would Put, uh, it says in Ephesians 6, um, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So that's one uh, part of the armor, we need complete armor of God and by taking that shield of faith see, come back to faith, we said earlier, faith needs to be introduced, we need to put our trust in God, then the enemy has no chance, so the moment that I allow the doubt in my mind to become stronger and stronger that moment a Satan gets hold of me and it is because I did not trust God. So I think that these doubts really is a matter of lack of trust. I, and that can have many different causes. But when I do not put my trust in God, the enemy is using that to put other uh, counterfeits or alternatives into my mind. And one of them is doubt. So... I'm not sure if I really have answered your question completely, but this would be the first point, to use the tools that God has given so then we, he can protect us against doubt. But that is also a growing process. Uh, when I am feeding myself on the word of God, I'll become stronger and stronger. Satan doesn't want me to become stronger, so he wants us to feed on a substitute or instead of the word of God. So it is essential that we feed our souls on the word of God. And when, doing, when we do that, those doubts will disappear. So is that sufficient for your question? Or, but it, I really encourage you to do that because by putting our trust in God, the doubts will go away. It will take time. But the Lord can use many different ways. When you read the scriptures or you talk with a friend who can help you, God has many different ways to help you get rid of that doubt. But if we doubt, it really means you have lack of trust in God. That's really the bottom line. Uh, 
Yes. But again, the verse that you quoted emphasizes faith. So faith is essential. And the verse you quoted in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So in order to keep us, the Lord wants us to follow him. There's two aspects. Yes, we are in the Lord's hand, but he wants us to follow him. If I say, well, I can follow this guru, well, no wonder that there are doubts or things like that. Or I can follow my own thoughts, then we don't put our trust in him anymore. So, but still, he is able to keep us from the wiles of the enemy. And that is the comfort of John 10. Um, for those who don't know that passage, but it may uh, not refer to that, but it's a very, very uh, helpful passage where the Lord speaks about his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. John 10, 27. The moment you have believed, you become a sheep of the good shepherd. And then in John 10, 27, it says, they hear my voice and I know them. There is a relationship. The moment you believe, there's a relationship between him and us, the believer. And then it says, they follow me. That means you put your trust in him, as we had in Romans 10 also. And then 28 says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then on top of that, and that's the point that uh, Nader quoted, my father who gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And then he says, I and my father are one. So this is a verse of security. If there are doubts in your mind, read this verse in John 10, and really meditate on that. And then it will help you that those doubts will go away. You are absolutely secure in him. Any other question? Shall we stop and uh, close in a word of prayer then? Is that okay? Lord Jesus, we just want to thank thee for this wonderful passage that we have read about the good shepherd and the sheep. And we pray that this may be the case for everyone present here tonight, that everyone may put his, her trust in the Lord Jesus as the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And now, Lord Jesus, we have read in this passage, I know them. What a thought that the good shepherd has a special relationship with every one of the sheep and they follow me. Help each one of the young people here, help each one of us to follow the Lord Jesus, to be his followers, to be the sheep that listen to his voice. There are many other voices in this world that try to intimidate us or to detract us or distract us or to lead us astray. Help us to tune in, to thy voice, Lord Jesus, to be satisfied with the word of God that we have, to follow the voice of the Good Shepherd and to be in thy presence and to enjoy this presence, this fellowship with the Lord Jesus and with one another. So we pray for one another. Watch over us on the roads. Watch over us in our activities and help us to follow the example that Paul explained to the Colossians to grow in this, to abound, abound also in thanksgiving, to flow over, as it were, in this thanksgiving. Help us to bring praise and glory to the name of our God and Father and to thy name, Lord Jesus. So we pray for one another here. <clears throat> Thou knowest the needs of each, each one, but there is no need that is unknown to thee. There is, no need that, there is no need that exists that cannot be helped. And so we give thanks to thee, Lord Jesus, and to our God and Father, and we commit each one here present into thy tender care, the, ter the care of the Good Shepherd. We praise and bless thy name. Amen.